Life after divorce. Can a divorced man remarry? Can a divorced woman remarry? Is it a sin to remarry? How to survive after divorce. A priest was not permitted or allowed to marry a widow, someone divorced. He was only to take to himself a virgin. I'm just letting you know, biblically. You're now listening to the No Pills Podcast your best resource for cultivating meaningful, healthy, long-lasting, romantic relationships that bloom into strong marriages. Welcome to No Pills. Welcome to No Pills. (laughs) Love fully scripted. We back, beloved, your man, God's man, G-Man, Brother Gordon. Good to see you, man. It's Brother G. We back in the place to be. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here with me. Appreciate you for that. Love you, family. Listen, today, life after divorce. Life after divorce. We've touched on divorce divorce before, but now we're going to get to the other side. What does the Bible say about divorce? Can a divorced man remarry? Can a divorced woman remarry? Can a divorced Christian remarry? Is it a sin to remarry? How to survive after divorce? We're getting into it today, friends. We are getting into it today, and I'm happy you're here with me. I'm happy you're here for it. Um, Divorce rate is high, you know, uh, in or out of the church. um, It's high, friends. You know, we are, depending on the statistics, they're all running at different, you know, somewhat, I'm hearing anything from 50 to 50 plus percent of marriages in a divorce. So I'm praying that this would be a a good topic for everybody, uh, for many people out there. Um, in conjunction with with the last episode where we covered this, I'm praying it would be profitable to the body, uh, to the person, to the individual, young and old alike, who just wants to answer some of these questions and are curious about um, divorce in the Bible and how to live after divorce. So if you want to get all that covered, stick around to the end. Don't, don't, Don't turn away. Don't scroll away uh, until you get to the end of this podcast, because I think you're going to really glean, uh, really be benefited by having a knowledge of what the Bible has to say and how to actually get along after not getting along. (laughs) All right, let's start at the foundation. Let me define marriage, because I know, you know, I know there's a lot of confusion just on the word marriage itself. So when I use the word marriage, I want to give you the definition that I mean and that I'm using, okay? When I say marriage, here's what I mean. The act of uniting a man and a woman for life, wedlock, the legal union of a man and woman for life, a man and a woman for life. Marriage is a contract, both civil and religious by which the parties engage to live together in mutual affection in fidelity till death shall separate them. Mm -hmm. Marriage was instituted by God himself for the purpose of preventing the promiscuous intercourse of the sexes for promoting domestic felicity and for securing the maintenance and education of children. See Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. That is what I mean when I say marriage. Amen? All right, now that we've got that out of the way, we want to make sure we're we're starting off at at a firm foundation and taking off from the same runway. That is what I, when I say marriage, that's what I mean. So when I'm talking about divorce, it's, it's exiting that union that institution that I have just described to you. All right, where did divorce come from? 
if in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve, for those who don't know what the reference is, the biblical reference I gave you, uh, the scriptural reference, Adam and Eve, God creates Adam first, takes a rib out of Adam's side, gives him a woman uh, to be his helpmeet, uh, take it from his side to be loved, cherished, not to be trampled upon, uh, not to be the head of him, but to be his equal his side, his other half, the completion of himself in the image of God as man and female, right? How do we go from that to divorce? What happened? Obviously, sin entered the world. And before you know it, so the divorce, right? Um, disrupting one of the two institutions given to us in perfection. When I say perfection, I mean before there was sin, before there was evil, Marriage was one of those perfect institutions given to humanity along with the Sabbath when you read the book of Genesis. But if marriage is supposed to be until death do us part, where did divorce come from? Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 8 is going to shed some light on this question. The Pharisees also came unto him, Jesus that is, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away or divorce his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, Adam and Eve, made them male and female? That's it, friends. That's where the comment, it's comment after that, just male and female. Not a long gambit list of, of divergent, different, multi, a multitude, multiplicity of different options, male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, come on men, move out of your mama's house, and shall cleave to his wife, not girlfriend, come on, not booty call, come on, and the two shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two or twain, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement? Rabbi, teacher, if it's so. And to put her away. Explain that to us. And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. Your heart. Mm. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. Of your hearts. Suffered, allowed you to put away, to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. This is so powerful. Because as you see it in perfection, as you see it, how God gave it right there with Adam and Eve tells you everything you need to know about the union. You know how many parties are involved. You know what the expectations are. It's pretty, pretty darn clear. But when that heart gets involved, that heart that is deceitfully wicked, desperately wicked, deceitful above all things, that's striving to be fed, divorce happens to answer the question, divorce happens because of the hardness of our hearts, because of the selfishness of our hearts, friends. The human heart's an interesting, oh, it's a dark place. Either spouse puts themselves before God and before their spouse. That's the reality. It could be the, the husband or the wife. They put themselves before God and before their spouse. It's about what I want. Mm -hmm. I'm bored. I'm not happy. I want more. I, I, I. Friends, listeners, you do know that I is in the middle of sin. I is in the middle of pride. And I is in the middle of selfishness. So why is there, look, you know, there's something to be said here if you peel this back. God desires our happiness our well-being, so much so that he allowed Moses, he allowed Moses to allow the people for a man to divorce his wife if he was just going to be an unpleasant treat to him 
or if he found some supposed uncleanness. But the real, the real, the real issue was the heart. So because he was gonna be, I don't know, a menace, a terror, <laughs> um, un unhappy, uh, uh, maybe abusive, he says, "Man, let there be." All right, because you guys are not going to stop, man. You keep stressing me. Oh, my wife this. She's not this. She's not that. Oh, she's unclean. I, let me get out. You want to get out of this marriage so bad. I'm going to give you what you want. And maybe even at the procurement of the party who wants to stay married. So in the Old Testament, when we're dealing with this topic of marriage, uh, there were some regulations on remarriage. Um, that varied in degree based upon who you were within the community, within the society of ancient Israel. And let me give you an example of what I mean. A priest was not permitted or allowed to marry a widow, someone divorced, some uh, fornicator, someone profane, or a harlot, uh, uh, you know, uh, a sex worker. Um, he was only to take to himself a virgin. Okay? Now, that was only solely applicable to the priest. And I can hear it now. Brother G, 1 Peter 2 verse 9, my brother. But we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, brother. I am a priest of God, with God, spiritually. Over my, I'm not marrying a woman who is not a virgin. Hey, man, more power to you. I'm just letting you know. Biblically, this was... A restriction placed upon the Levitical priesthood, and they were not allowed to marry anyone who had been divorced um, as a priest. Now, what's interesting and perhaps important to note here is that divorcee, divorcees, uh, those women who were divorced, were not shut out of society. They were not thrown away. They were. They did not become. Um, the untouchables. Uh, but you'll find in Leviticus 22 in Numbers 30, chapter 30, that the divorced um, daughter of a priest was permitted to go back home and eat and be cared for at her father's table. So it wasn't because, you know, I think sometimes there's, a, you know, the, um, the scarlet letter type approach we have a lot of times with each other in our in our humanity. You know, like, oh man, you're, you're too dirty. You're, you're you're unclean, and and uh, you know, we're not we're not God, friends. We need to set perimeters and boundaries and expectations and uphold the standard, um, but simu simultaneously um, being practical, being reasonable, being gracious, being loving. Can I say that, friends? Do we understand what I'm saying there? So I just think that was, that was something interesting I wanted to point out because I I, I know a lot of times we can. We can take a really aggressive approach sometimes to sin when it doesn't deal with us and when we're not the person sinning and we're not the person that has fallen in sin or been tricked. You know, when we're not that, when we're not the violator, sometimes we can be less gracious, <laughs> less merciful. You know what I mean? Just just keeping it real with you. Let's just be honest. That's how the human, you know how we be sometimes as humans, man. You know how we get down. You know how to get and gets down with the human element, the human mind, that human heart of ours. Um, also, I want to note this. This may, ooh, may make some of you feel a little uncomfortable, but it's the truth. As I was covering the text here in preparation for this for, for the podcast, I noticed that these are there are clear distinctions of your sexual past that stick with you until you die. Here's what I mean. Uh, the priest would have had to have known if you were a fornicator if you were a sex worker, if you were a widow, or if you were a divorcee because he could not marry you. So if you want to call it a stigma, if you want, it just follows you. Friends, you cannot go back and be a virgin over again. You know, I spoke about this, I think, on the last podcast. Um, you know, we use this term in Christianity, you know, born-again virgin. I understand what that means. I covered it on the last podcast. Go back and watch that one. Um but in, in all actuality, in all literalness, <laughs> literally speaking, you can only be a virgin until you're not a virgin no more. So if you had been divorced, you would be, you could not marry a priest. 
If you were a widow, you cannot marry a priest. Doesn't mean your life is over. Doesn't mean we all hate you and don't like you. But the fact is, this man's by requirement, he can only marry a virgin. It is what it is. I feel like we say that today and people get a fit. I'm a women. I love you, ladies. I love my sisters in Christ, even not in Christ, but tend to get offended when with the idea or thought that, hey, my, my sexual past could actually impact my future or how I'm even perceived or looked at today. Listen, friends, I'm a for, I, I was a fornicator. I did not wait to have sex until I was married. And even as a man, and especially as a Christian man now, I don't take pride in that. Like, you know, I'm as many of you know, I'm widowed now, right? Um, just a little, a little over three years. And, you know, if I were to meet someone else, like I oh, they're gonna know that I'm not a virgin. You know? Uh and I have no problem revealing, hey, now, not not because just my wife passed away, I'm not a virgin, but like I had sexual partners before my wife. And whatever comes along with that, comes along with that. I'm a big boy. I made my decision, no matter if it was informed, not informed, enlightened, not enlightened. I, you know, I make your bed, you lie in it. I just noticed this as I was picking picking and scroll, not scrolling, but as scrolling, I'm not scrolling to my, well, I could have been if I was on my electronic Bible, but as I was just digging in to the Bible on this issue, I just realized that, yeah, man, like these, these, the sexual past stuck with them. That's it. It was on you. Fornicator, sex worker, divorcee, like it was on you, stuck, stuck with you, not going anywhere. Everyone needs to know. That was it. Take it or leave it. Don't, don't, don't trip over. It. Stick, stick with me to the end. All right, stick with me to the end. All right. Can divorcees remarry? What does this mean for us today? Okay, we've we've we're, we're trying to get. We're going to try to extract from the scriptures. What does it mean for you and I today if you are divorced? All right answering some of those questions that we kind of open with, you know, well, can a Christian remarry? Is that, is it a sin to remarry? Is it male or female? Can you like, what can we do? All right. So let's begin to peel back that answer, get to that answer. In Matthew 19, Jesus went on to say this in verse eight, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. We're going to look into, well, what, what did Moses allow? What was the the laws concerning divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one through four. Let's read it together now so we, you and I can get the proper framework and context to this discussion on divorce. And verse one, when a man have taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she, that she find no favor in his eyes because he have found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the second husband, not like her, and write her a bill of divorcement and give it to her in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband or the second husband die, which took her to be his wife, her first husband, the former husband, which sent her away, may not marry her again. Mm. After she has been defiled by the second husband, for that is an abomination before Yahweh, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the Lord Yahweh thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, here's something interesting that I want to mention here. Um, we're clearly, this, this law is clearly written in the context of a patriarchal system. Um, and it was the men, it would be the husband that would actually give the wife the bill of divorcement. Like the men would be the ones filing for divorce. And, the, the, the wife would go back to her father's house where she was being taken care of, right? I mean, a lot of times, you know, you, a woman's not out there living on her own 
on any property because God forbid a band of, of men would come by and just be able to take everything from her. So in this patriarchal system, they, the men were filing a divorce. What a contrast to today. What a contrast to today where most divorces are filed by women. I just found this very interesting. Like, wow, like when you see divorcement biblically, it's the men who are filing for the divorce. But today, men don't file for divorce at half the rate that women are. So crazy how the whole patriarchy, right, that is sometimes is talking about is matriarchy and there's more divorces when women have the right to file for divorce. Interesting. Interesting. Um, also, let's, let's, let's bring this home a little bit here. God permits divorce and remarriage, right, in this context, but clearly taught his ideal should be followed and kept, which is until death do you part. So in, we see the context and the framework in which, boom, divorce was given, Okay. It says here, 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 here's the here's the law in regards to divorce. If you find some uncleanness, it's really some type of issue, your heart is just not right, fit, set on your wife, then you could divorce her and she is free to remarry someone else. This is not my ideal, though. I, I want you to stay married forever, marry the right person, be with the person you're supposed to be until you die. All right? So I, I want to just bring this in. And, and for another added piece of information that's I think can shed some more light on this, in the Bible, okay, in the Bible, God, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 1, in Jeremiah 3, verse 8, he divorces the nation of Israel. God was God said he's, he married Israel, she is his bride, etc. The church is his bride, right? And but there are two clear accounts in the in, in the writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah where he tells the prophet to tell. Hey, man, prophesying to my people, I have forsaken them. I have put them away. I have divorced them because they have been unfaithful to me. They've played the harlot. They've been adulterous as they worshiped false gods and idols. They've cheated on me with idolatry. Interesting. Just interesting. But this is not the whole story yet. Not the whole picture. So don't. Don't get hyped and say, oh, okay, woo, all right, I have grounds to just marry and remarry as I please. Thank you, Brother Gordon. Woo, do not turn off the podcast. <laughs> don't do that to me. You got to watch the whole, don't turn it off right here and go, woo, I got a license, man. Let me get down and get down to get down. Yes. Thank you, brother. And turn it off. No. There's more. There's more. Matthew 19, verse 9 says this. Jesus says, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for sexual immorality, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doeth commit adultery. All right, now we got a really full picture here. It's getting serious now, friends. Yeah. This is a little different than what we had going on in Deuteronomy. So God permits people to divorce and to remarry, but only, only if the reason is for infidelity, like legitimate unfaithfulness. Where there is legitimate unfaithfulness, you now can divorce. And if that's not the reason you have gotten divorced, you, your wife, and whoever you both choose to remarry after that, all four of you are now committing adultery in the eyes of God. Wow. Wow. And you think about how we live today in our society. Like, this is heavy. This is, this is heavy. We're just out here marrying and giving in marriage. Third, fourth marriage. And meanwhile, if we have not separated because of adultery, infidelity, unfaithfulness, cheating, then we're pulling down other people into the sin of adultery in the eyes of God. I want to let that sink in. 
I want to let that sink in, friends. Marriage, this is a heavy thing. This is not a light thing. Now, in the case where there is infidelity in the marriage, legit, the Bible is silent, to my knowledge, if the adulterer, the unfaithful party, has grounds or rights to get remarried. Uh, what I'm saying is, as I read the text, it, it it's silent, but it's almost a question as if, well, if I cheat, then I'm supposed to remain single until I die. So take that for what it's worth. Go back, look at, that, look at that yourself and tell me if you run into anything differently in the chat, in the comments. Jump down in the comment section on the YouTube and let me know if you see something else there that I don't see. All right, because as I've read it, studied it, it's like, mm, it's like the Bible's quiet. Like you don't really know, like, is is the is the is the adulterer able to go remarry? The person who has been violated, the the party that was offended, definitely has free grounds legally in the eyes of God to go remarry someone else. But the offender, I'm not sure. It's it's pretty it's, it's silent to my knowledge. But I love to see your um, responses, thoughts in the comment section. Um, and I'll be looking for those responses to those thoughts. If they, I, I'll, I'll check the comments. <laughs> um, but mm, if an unbelieving spouse leaves the believing spouse, Bible covers this though. Let's say you're new to the faith, you come to Christ, and both you and your spouse were not believers, and one of you becomes a believer, and then the non-believing spouse says, "Yo, I'm out of here, I'm gone. Let them leave, and you are free to remarry. Bible covers that scenario when you're talking about divorce, Okay. Now, there's other scenarios that I think arise in our modern living that is the Bible is pretty silent on too, unless you take a really rigid, strict approach. Um, when I'm and I'm talking about physical, emotional, spiritual abuse, um, substance abuse, pornography, like these things that damage a marriage and damage the other person in the marriage. Uh, by the letter of the law, from what we see scripturally, it's like you will only separate if there's physical infidelity. But I would say this. Here's the counsel I always give on this regard, on this front. Do, I, do not stay under the same roof with a, a person that is abusing you, right? That's just almost common sense. Um, and a lot of times, I mean, you won't be able to afford that. I mean, it, it becomes a whole deal. There's kids involved. It can get really messy really fast. But if that... If the abuser is not willing to get the help that you need, you need to separate and get space between you and them for your physical safety, emotional, phys for your safety and for the safety potentially of your children. Live under a separate roof, family member, someone else, I don't know, hotel, whatever you got to, however you got to get it figured out, get that separation and then give that, that, the abuser time to get help. And I'm not, I don't encourage anyone to go get divorced at this point, but you separate and let time work its course. I, one or two things are going to happen. Either that person is going to get, the abuser is going to get the help they need, male or female, or they're going to cheat on you. And once they commit adultery, they're going to violate the covenant, the contract, and you will be free in the eyes of God to move on. Um, but I, I say this recognizing there could be some really extreme cases out there. I know as far as um, what, People today, human beings, may constitute as cheating in the in in this digital world that we live in, with the corn, with the OnlyFans, with the money, with the. Uh, I, I get that some of these communications and so forth can be like, yo, man, like you. Only thing you were lacking was opportunity. So, um, unfortunately, the Bible does not give us a long description of what to do in every case scenario down to computers and technology today. So be prayerful, amen? Seek counsel. Don't go it alone. Uh, pastor, counselor, someone to shed light, third party. Uh, and, I would, and I would encourage you to get a spiritual, someone you spiritually trust that knows the word of God and understands the word of God and can look at the your particular scenario objectively. Amen? Objectively. Okay, so... What listen, marriage is serious. If you haven't gotten that yet, that this is I say this because the world and media and contemporary thought just plays down 
the severity and solemnity and sacredness of marriage today. It's just like, ah, I dust my hands of it. I'm done with it. I'm moving on. It's disposable. I'll get a new one tomorrow and I'll just, you know, I'll just move on. I don't care if I break hearts, break homes, destroy children, destroy families, just whatever. Like this is, let me give you some examples of what I mean about the how, how you can see, before I give you the examples, let me show you how you can tell and notice how serious and sacred marriage is. God, Jesus, likens the church as his bride, as a wife, as a woman that he marries. God marries the church. So marriage is a type of that that symbolizes the relationship between God and his people. And when Moses struck the rock twice in the wilderness, and that rock was to represent Jesus, and he was supposed, it was a type of Jesus, a future, a prophecy, right? But he, but in verses speaking to it, he struck it. That violation was so severe and so significant in the eyes of God by Moses messing up the typology that he was kept out of the promised land. So when we mess up the typology with marriage, I'm just saying one plus one equals two, friends, put it together. This is not a light thing. And here's what we do. Hollywood, Zaza Gabor, married nine times. Jennifer O'Neill, nine marriages. Mickey Rooney, eight marriages. Larry King, eight marriages. My young, my, 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 my Gen Z's might not know what I'm talking about. Elizabeth Taylor, married eight marriages times. These are all Hollywood, well-prominent, well-known, massive Hollywood stars that rank at the top of being married the most. And yet we wonder, and we sit in amazement with question marks over our head, like how did we ever get to a place of hookup culture? How do we, how do we get to a place of hookup culture? Pfft. Is it hard to tell? When we've got, when we've got, uh, Heck, I mean, Jennifer Lopez, I mean, they try to turn around. They got hear somebody tell me, oh, she's married again. Mar like going back, marrying people she's already married, violation. Mar like it's wild. Three, four. I'm not picking anybody. I'm just saying these Hollywood stars are set up as stars, as idols before the people. And then we look at them and it's like, well, hey, if I'm married four times, that's not as bad as being married nine times. Right. It lessens the solemnity. It lessens the holiness, the sacredness of marriage when people just trample upon it and we treat it so lightly and we just are marrying and being remarried, married and giving in marriage, married and married. This is exactly what Jesus prophesied, how it would be before he came back. Marriage institution would be taken lightly. Mm. So. Here's what I see actually happen in practice today. So let me just get down to the practical, like what literally happens today when divorcees want to get remarried? What, what do I see happen in the church, right, with, with the Christians who are studying the Bible? And this is where I see the plane normally land, okay? It's almost like remarriage, when it comes to remarriage, it almost, like, it, it happens without restrictions. And Here's why I believe it happens without restrictions. Grace, forgiveness, and reconciliation, like in the Christian mind, trump everything. <laughs> like it's like, hey man, if uh, I'm, God forgave me when I wasn't supposed to be forgiven, I've been reconciled to God. He takes me as His bride. Like this is licensed. If someone is, has repented, turned from sin, trying to get it right, let them remarry. Like grace, forgiveness, reconciliation, paramount. Then. Paramount. Then with that is kind of like I would call the theology of better to marry than to burn. Paul is like, hey, if you cannot maintain and keep your virgin, if you cannot, you know, maintain your flesh, bring your body into subjection, it's better for you to marry than to burn in your lust, to burn in your flesh, or to burn in the lake of fire. So this is another prominent thought, I think, that sits out there in the Christian mind that says, hey, someone's converted, someone's come to the church, they've been divorced. Okay, and let's say they, they've been, and they haven't been divorced for, um, the grounds that God has said, and it's like, well, if you marry somebody else, it will be considered adultery. And you would say to yourself like, man, well, then they, they shouldn't get married. I'm telling you, in practice, the Christian goes, but mm, better than married than to burn. The Christian goes, well, what about grace and forgiveness? And we open the door that Jesus said clearly behind it was adultery, but we do it in the auspices of grace and go and sin no more. So I think that idea of like, well, 
We would prefer that you would start again, start with a clean slate, go and sin no more, be married to somebody you're going to be faithful to, you're going to love, you're going to do it right, you're going to do it God's way, and we're praying the grace of God covers that. Friends, I'm here to say, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, just from the standpoint that Jesus was very clear in calling it what it was, but also we did see him administer a lot of grace. He's saying, listen, if you get married to someone else and you've been divorced and it wasn't for the cause of adultery, I mean, for the, for the cause of infidelity, then you're, you are now committing adultery. So, I mean, it's very clear as it's stated. But in the practical world in which we live, <sighs> If a person is struggling to remain sexually pure and there's someone who's willing to marry them and they're willing to marry them and, and want to be faithful and have a, a, a new start in God, in Christ, I, I've never seen any church, no matter the denomination, faith, not get behind that. Because I think statistically speaking, even society, societally speaking, like, the country, the nation does better when people are married, when people are in long-term committed monogamous relationships. So I would, I would, I would say to the listener, shoot for the ideal. <laughs> so you don't even have to cross these bridges, right? Like do it God's way. Your relationship is the car. The Bible is the owner's manual. God is the manufacturer. Do it. God's way. If you're young, you haven't had sex, you're not married, you're a virgin, man, marry another virgin. Like, wait on God. Wait for him to, like, just do it his way because it will be less heartache in the long run if you do it that way. All right? Now, how to survive after divorce. So let's say, okay, you're clear to get married for sure, or clear to get remarried for sure, this person has cheated on you. Now it's like, where do I go from here? Where do I go from here? All right, so. Or you're even in a situation where you're you're, you're, you're under the like, you know what? I'm going to take God at his grace. I need to be remarried. I can't be single. This is driving me crazy. I'm going to, I don't want to fall into sin, so I'm going to get remarried. Okay, so whatever one of these two kind of plateaus you're on uh, or two starting points you're, you're coming from. Let's say you're, 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 you're in the clear to get remarried, okay, and you're a divorcee. First thing I want to say to you, first thing I want to recommend, my first bit of counsel is make sure that that marriage is completely, irres like you cannot reconcile it. Like make sure that it's really over, that it's really done, that there's absolutely no possible chance for reconciliation before you do anything else, right? There's some amazing examples in the Bible of God's love and his reconciliation, Hosea bringing his wife back, et cetera. So you want to make sure that that door is really closed in your own heart and in your spouse's heart. Like you're saying like, you know what? I, I know I cannot deal with the fact or reality that you have cheated on me. I want to tell you, I have friends, people I know, Christians that love them in Christ that have, have experienced infidelity, okay, where their spouse, not talking about wasn't online, talking to somebody online, flirting online, posting a picture. No, literally cheated on them with another person and they stuck it out and their families are doing great. Kids involved, everything. Like, So check your heart first and check the heart of your spouse and make sure that there is no opportunity for reconciliation, right? You know, haste makes waste. So be prayerful about the hurt that you're going through and really ask God, God, what would you have me to do? And am, am I in a place where I could be mature enough um, to even deal with something like this, to deal with this type of hurt and harm? Like, Yo, someone, someone cheating on you, that's a, that's a violation, right? Like, I'm not down, I'm, I'm not saying reconciliation lessens the violation. I'm just saying do everything in your power to check with yourself and with God to know that this marriage is really over. That's the first bit of counsel I have for you. 
But if you decide to move on, if you decide to move on, then I say to you, pray to God that you will not harbor any hatred or bitterness towards your ex. You've got to you got to be dealing with that first before you even think about moving on to another relationship. Like, because you 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 could very well be drinking poison, the poison of bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, hoping that it's going to kill your spouse. Like, yeah, I'm drinking the poison, hoping it's going to kill you, right? You've heard of this crazy nonsense, but it happens. So really check with yourself. Really get with God in your prayer closet and and say, Lord, is do I have forgiveness? Is it there? Like, do I have that that divine forgiveness that you had? Have have I forgiven this person? Because, I, friend, if you have not forgiven that your ex, if you have like if you're still holding on to that, I guarantee you it would negatively impact your future marriage. Guarantee it. So that's my first step advice for you. If you're deciding to move on, pray to God to make sure that you've got some healing taking place in your heart. You may be dealing with depression. People are getting divorced at all ages. It don't matter when. I mean, I, I mean, it's like 60, 70, 20, 30 years together. Boop, we just, I don't want to be here no more with you. Like the, people are, people's hearts are being destroyed. Lives are being destroyed, destroyed. Mental health being destroyed with these selfish acts like this. You've got to be real with yourself and be like, yeah, man, am I in a place of depression right now? Like, how am I going to bounce back from this? How am I going to get my life? Especially if you're in a situation where you you sacrifice uh, a part of you for the the marriage, like you should have, right? Like, this this could be massive. So don't just go out there and think like, oh, what's that secular saying they say? Uh, to get over somebody, have to get under somebody else. That is a doctrine of the devil. Doctrine of the devil. Can I keep it real with you? Welcome to No Pills. The doctrine of the devil. No, you need to get on your knees and get close to Jesus. Okay? Listen, when you, when you, when you, when you go through a divorce, man, it's like losing a spouse to death. You know I mean, I lost my wife. She was 37 years old. Like, I had to, I have to take active steps to be in charge of my mental health. I'm in the gym four days a week. No matter if I like it or not, I'm tr I try to eat healthy, right? Try to get to bed on time, drink enough water, have my devotional times with the Lord, love on other people, go to church, have community, talk, express my fit. Like mental health is serious, friends. Don't think you're going to go through some traumatic experience like a divorce and you're just okay. And you're just, I'm fine. I'm all right. I'm mentally okay. No, I doubt that very much. Because I can equate it to you losing your wife. Listen, as, as, as much faith as I have in the resurrection, in the hope of God, in the promises of God, I still mourn, right? You still mourn. But you should be mourning with hope. You should be mourning with redirection. You should be mourning with revelation from God. So, friends, I'm telling you, when I'm, listen, this is... Someone else would charge you for this. I'm giving you real world, real life experience. It's no joke. Do not downplay your mental health when you've gone through something traumatic and are going through something traumatic like a divorce. Deal with it head on, head up, with prayer, with 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 Bible reading, with helpful lifestyle, helpful. Get on it. Be aggressive about it. Grab the bull by the horns, as they say. And don't find yourself locked away in some room dark, depressed, and not getting out and living life anymore. Work on being a better you. What does that look like? Strengthening your personal relationship with Jesus. When I say work on being a better you, this ain't some new age. This ain't some self-improvement, self-help book. I'm, I'm talking about being a better you is being more like Christ. Where more of you decreases and Christ increases. And get your spirituality figured out and dialed in, right? Because potentially, 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 somewhere in the equation, you you may have you may have helped in your divorce. Right? I don't know every person's situation who's listening to my podcast, but some of you know what's going on. You and you and God know. 
right? So you got to make sure that you are aligned with, with Christ. You're aligned with God. Vertically, get your vertical relationship right first so that all your horizontal relationships are going to work, right? So that vertical relationship needs to be in place first. Then you can better engage with other relationships. You can have, like, they're going to be healthier now because that vertical relationship is healthy. Everything else is going to stem from that in a healthy, positive way because now you're, you're tapped into the source. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Amen? You got to be plugged into the source. Make sure you are in a place where you can trust again. I'm serious, friends. Make sure you are in a place where you can trust again. Not that you think you can trust again, but you're really in a place where you're, you're able to be vulnerable again. I think a lot of times, divorcees, we, you, you, you don't get back to that place. You don't trust again. You're not willing to be vulnerable. Listen, man, being vulnerable is scary. That's, it's scary because you can get hurt. You can get into another relationship and be hurt again. That's scary, friends. This is why you need God. This is why you need God at the helm. This is why you need God picking, choosing, and selecting, giving you wisdom, impressions, direction through his word, through song, through other believers, through community. Like, it takes a village. Listen, if it takes a village to raise a family, man, to raise kids, man, it takes a village to pick up, to get a spouse right. Let me tell you, if you know better, do better. Come on. What am I saying? You need to prayerfully approach the idea of being married again. Yeah. If you know better, do better. If you chose wrong last time, there's a strong possibility you're going to choose wrong again. So you got to get it, you got to get it right this time. It's like, God, I, I need you. I'm going to work on my relationship with you, Jesus. I'm going to get my health in order, get my mind clear, get my mind right. And then, you know, maybe go back and reevaluate what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a husband, and make sure that I'm in the position, in the place, emotionally, physically, spiritually, to be that help meet, to be that spiritual priest of my home, that leader, to actually be somebody else's spouse. Last thing I want to leave with you. Your new spouse, listen to me closely, friends. If you're divorced, you're a divorcee, and maybe you're in a relationship now. Maybe you're considering a relationship in the future. You want to be married again. You want to do it right, etc. It is important for you to remember that your new spouse cannot fix you. Your new spouse cannot fix your harm, your hurt, your lack of trust. It can, they cannot fix your present, past hurts. They, they are not the healing agent. They, they cannot mend your brokenness. Only God can do that, friends. Only God can do that. I'm Gordon McGee. This is No Pills, Love Fully Scripted, and I'm signing off, and I'll catch you next week.